and welcome to Life in the Law. I'm Marianne Sasaki. Uh, today we, had a, we have a guest who is very difficult to uh, acquire. I've been begging him to come on for some time. He's, he finally acceded to my uh, requests. And he's my husband, Andrew Sasaki. So welcome, Andrew. Welcome, Marion. <laughs> it's good to see you I'm for glad the first you're time here. in hours. I've been asking you for months since I've been on. Andrew actually has a longer life in the law than I do because his father was a judge. So he's been in the law since he's been zero years old, right? Your father was a lawyer. Approximately zero. Right. Right. So he was can... in the uh, prosecutor's office at yeah. that time. Oh, wow. So we can talk about your life in the law a little later, but let's talk <laughs> about your life now. Andrew is an IT professional, and he, uh, I was going to say practiced many years, but I guess worked many years in New York City. Um, what did, and what did you do? What, I mean, I have no idea. Well, you know, I was in IT operations, so I you know, mostly built out infrastructure and, uh, and, and planned for upgrades and things like that. So uh, it would be everything from, from uh, you know, going into an empty space and deciding what kinds of, uh, what kinds of network equipment needed to be there and how the hard wires were going to run and, you know, all that up to doing server rooms and uh, virtualized infrastructure like, uh, like VMware and, um, you know, in the cloud. I'm sure there are people out there that will understand a word of that. There are probably lots of people <laughs> there that won't un understand the word of that. It's, it's a little esoteric if you're not in the industry. So. so, but you're here today really because you just completed a very exciting experience and you're embarking on an adventure in hacking, aren't you? You know, I thought I was here today because you needed a last minute guest. Well, that also. Well, so Don't give away my purpose. secrets to the audience. Oh, you, you can edit that out. Though, okay, right? we'll try. Okay. So no, but tell us about um, Dev League and what you did there and why it's so exciting for Hawaii and why Hawaii is like on the cusp of being a new Silicon uh, Center. You know, there are really a lot of efforts to make it into that and uh, I think Dev League is part of that. So Dev League, if you don't know, is an IT boot camp. Those have come into popularity in recent years. They're, uh, they're really high intensity. Um, very specialized kind of trade schools where you go for a short period of time and and you really learn uh, web design and and uh, you know web programming coding and all that stuff very intensely typically in a short period of time like how short well dev league was three months and it was uh, six days a week 11 hours a day and you were doing nothing but coding that entire time so it's total immersion in the in total the, in immersion so I have a question so what's coding so coding is, you know, they used to they used to call it programming, but you know, programming is, is uh, I guess they call it coding more now that it's, uh, you know, as for the web. I think there's kind of a I think there's kind of a distinction people make between programming, which is where you're writing some kind of a program that people are using on computers, and uh, coding, which is like which a language, is, right? Yeah, yeah, which is doing stuff for the web usually. Right, right, right. So. Um, well, there's kind of a, a gray area, you know. I've I've heard both views. So was the boot camp the hardest thing you've ever done? It probably was. Because you, you it was really hard. Because you were out six days a week, eleven hours a day, learning coding, right? You know, just just the loss of time that you have in committing to something eleven hours a day, you know, for that length of time is like you really miss the extra time. You don't I, realize until it's gone. I can't even you know, imagine sitting in do. front of a computer screen for 11 hours a day. I mean, that's, that alone is, you know, just a marathon. Well, it's true. Sometimes you're, sometimes you're watching, uh, sometimes you're watching a, a lecture or a demonstration. Sometimes you're working with somebody else, and they're the ones that are, that are at the computer, and you're kind of doing co-pilot stuff. So now, what what have you? What's your big takeaway from boot camp? What what was? Did you learn a big lesson or a lot of little lessons or what? And what would you tell people if they were thinking about going to boot camp? I would tell people if they're thinking of going to a boot camp. Um, I think uh, most people can do it if they're if they're really dedicated. But it's definitely a lot of effort, and you. I think there's a misconception that people need a lot of technical skill in order to go in and do something like that, but it's not. You have to be willing to learn, I think, and willing to put in uh, a lot of time and effort to do it. And if you can meet those criteria, and I think more people can than they realize, uh, then you can do it. Yes, you, you can. You can do it. Even if you're a lawyer, you could go to DevLink if you're interested in IT. Yeah, I think even attorneys could do it. I think so. I think it'd probably be good for attorneys, although they, they used to marathon work schedules, so that would be kind of... You know, familiar to them, I think. Right. Um, 
you know, more so maybe in some places than others, but yeah, definitely. So, so what? So what was your takeaway from Dev? Well, f first of all, we have to say the Dev League is one of the best of these in the country. It's gotten numerous awards um, uh, for being the one of the best uh, coding boot camps in the country, right? I, I don't know how many awards it's gotten or anything, but but it's definitely uh, it's definitely one of the best ones. But then that, I think that's very significant that it's located here in Hawaii. Um, because I, I think something is emerging. I think we're, we're um, at a new frontier with, Jay Fidel thinks so also, with respect to um, I, you know, information technology and computer development. Yeah, in a way I think Hawaii maybe has a little bit of an advantage because they're a little isolated from the mainland. So they maybe don't have the, uh, they maybe came into it without um, as much uh, infrastructure on the technical side as, uh, as maybe in some of the big cities on the mainland. So, um, in a way, it's maybe easier to move forward with all of that uh, legacy stuff keeping you back. That, that's great. I mean, it's, we were talking about that the other day. We were talking about how some place, places in Europe or India didn't have a good infrastructure and they became wired in a very sophisticated fashion because there was nothing there to begin with. And so that, it's sort of analogous in that, in that way, right? Right. I think the other day what we were talking about was, um, was like Italy. Uh, oh, Italy, was, that's right. For the longest time, you know, uh, notorious for having one of the worst phone systems oh, in Europe. Oh, it was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. And so I because attest. they had this lousy infrastructure, when mobile came in, you know, it was, it was really easy to replace that lousy infrastructure because all of a sudden here's this new thing. You know, and uh, and you didn't have to support the old thing when you're moving over to the new one. So, so now what's what's the hackathon? Is it connected to Dev League, or I mean, what what's the connection? What is it, and what and what are you what are you doing? What that? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, typically, a hackathon is where you you have a contest with uh, a bunch of individuals or teams that are competing to uh, to create some kind of program in a short amount of time. Um, uh, hackathons, be, you know, become uh, popular, but um, really the, the government decided to, the state government decided to get into uh, the hackathon business and have a hackathon that would be um, on behalf of the state. So there were a bunch of teams that, uh, that got together and uh, there were some presentations about a week and a half ago over Aloha Tower on um, different government agencies that had needs that, um, that they could really use some help. And this was the brainchild of the new CIO of Hawaii, right? Right, whose name I'm blanking on at the moment. <laughs> I was hoping you would remember. Well, I, I'm, I'm blanking I don't up, but it'd be a really good name to have on hand. Don't <laughs> yes, you think? it really would. But, but I, I, um, the fact that he's a new um, CIO, he, he's brought in a whole like fresh approach to um, the needs of the government and um, Im implementing uh, sophisticated. Uh, uh, programmers and, and coders in governmental departments, which hadn't been a priority before, I think. Uh, I think it hasn't, you know, and when you talk about, and when we are talking earlier on about having legacy infrastructure, you know, the government is one of those places that really has a lot of legacy infrastructure. So I think in a lot of ways it's been an issue keeping government from moving forward on the IT side. But, um, but you're right. This is like a this is like a pretty innovative thing for them to be doing, and I've heard really good things about uh, the state's efforts in this regard. So, what, what kinds of um, so every a bunches of people have projects, right, that they're doing in order to kind of like win this hackathon. That's how it go, goes. Yes. Like there are teams, right? There are teams. And so, are there teams that are sub specifically addressing um, issues the State Department has, or can you just? address any sort of governmental issue you think is important? Well, for the hackathon, there were about a, a half a dozen different presentations from different agencies, and uh, each team is addressing uh, one of those. Okay. So there are multiple teams on, on some of them, and some only have, you know, maybe one team. So what are some teams, what are they working on, do you know? So some of the projects were um, made in Hawaii uh, agricultural, agricultural items, and, and food. Uh, another one was for farmers markets. There was one that was for um, uh, visitations at the, at the jail. Oh, that's, that's a terrific okay. idea. Yeah. 
Yeah, that is the you know the the story that they told there was that there's there's um, just so little manpower and so few resources. Right. You know, there's basically like one phone line, and people might travel by bus from the opposite side of the island to visit someone who's in prison. Right. And they try and call to make an appointment, and there's only the one line, right. which. If it's busy, you know, you're just not going to get through. Oh, yeah, that really lends itself to an application, uh, definitely. Because, you know, I wor worked in the Prisoners' Rights Project, and I know uh, that visitation is not a high priority, and it's often... Um, I w bungled is a is a strong word, but but it it doesn't get the attention that it deserves probably. And people are, do f travel from far from far away, and there are missed appointments or mis miscommunications with respect to appointments and visiting hours and things like that. And and often people are traveling by public transportation, so it's you know really a hard on on the visitor. So if if they can fix that to some extent, that would be a great great. Uh, advance I think. Well it would be. It's a little surprising that there hasn't really that there hasn't really been any effort towards this uh, so far and they're still in this system where they have the one phone. I'm not surprised really because um, I think people don't want to think about prisoners, they don't want to think about prison systems. Ours is so huge and growing and baroque and it's it just it's like a, a leviathan, you know. You, don't, you to to attack it, you need you need to, you know like special powers or something. Well, you know, I, I think you bring up a good point, which is that uh, the prison system is growing, and it's really its own special industry. Right. And I really don't think it's you know there there's there's profit in in dealing with a lot of aspects of prisons, but I don't really think there's a lot of of profit in um, accounting for. Prison visitors, right, I don't think so. Right, so so that's not really a profit center in the way that housing prisoners is. Right, or, or so, producing products in prisons, which has been privatized, right, right. that kind of thing. Right. So I'm going to take a quick break, and after we come back, maybe we can talk about some more uh, other uh, subjects that we like to usually talk about, politics and, and some this other and that. exciting IT things. <laughs> and yeah, some Perhaps other. Even Donald Trump. Donald Trump. We love to talk about him. So we're going to take a quick break. You're watching Life in the Law. I'm Marian Sasaki. Stay tuned. I pity the fool who ain't watching this show at 12 o'clock on Friday afternoon. Stan, the energy man. Watch it. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays. 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. And the show is about... Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. Thanks for watching Think Tech this summer. We have a lot of terrific shows of great importance, and I hope you'll watch my show too every Tuesday at noon as we address sustainability issues for Hawaii. They're really pertinent as the World Conservation Congress approaches in September and the World Youth Congress that's focusing on sustainability next year as well. Have a great summer and tune in at noon every Tuesday. Hi, welcome back to Life in the Law. I'm speaking with Andrew Sasaki, and yeah, full disclosure, he's my husband, but he's also an IT professional and involved in the state hackathon. And it's it's fascinating that the steps the state is taking to modernize the IT industry in Hawaii and, and hopefully bring it up to you know a state of the art. Uh, uh, product or practice or what, what would be state-of-the-art art industry, I guess is the right word, right? Right. Well, they really are making efforts in that regard. And I've heard some, you know, I've heard some good things about people who were involved in the hackathon and, you know, not government people, but people who are outside of government. Uh, so they're so really what's your hackathon efforts. subject? Uh, my hackathon subject is going to be campaign finance. And well, what, it is campaign finance. And, and what will you do? I mean, how, how will that manifest? Do you know yet? So what we're trying to do is um, is create a nice uh, database of campaign finance, uh, where the where the donations are coming from, where the where the where the money's being spent, and hopefully link that up to uh, link that up to the candidates in a nice searchable database. Oh, that's terrific! That would be great. And I'd like to know that. Would that be open to the public? It would. Oh, that w I'd love to know that information. Everything is part of the challenge is going to be open to the public. Now, there's already there's already something that's like that but it doesn't quite meet the needs that they're hoping for, so uh, 
we're maybe going to modernize it. I would be totally interested in that. That's, you know, well, you know I'm, I love politics, and I'm always willing to talk about politics. So do you want to talk a little bit about politics? Do you want to talk about politics? Well, we don't disagree, so I'm, it's, I'm it's very <laughs> boring. Is it? <laughs> Isn't what, it? What we talk about? We could talk about uh, the fact that um, Hillary Clinton will probably be the first female president of the United States. Did you think you'd ever see that in your lifetime? You know, I, I did. Um, I thought it was a possibility back in the, in the 80s. Really? With Geraldine Ferraro? Yeah, I mean, like it could that happen. That, that, you know, that someone could be a vice president and be a woman. Or why not president? You know, if you've, if you've gone that far, you're, you're an inch away. What do you think about the rise of Donald Trump? What do you think it says about um, uh, Americans, American spirit, or Amer what, what's, what's propelling this campaign, which is such an odd an odd campaign. I mean, it's flip-flops back and forth, and it's it's built upon uh, nationalism and anti, you know, sort of anti-globalism. What, I mean, what, who is he speaking to? He's speaking to, he's speaking to um, right-wing media listeners. You know, it's really clear to me when, when I look at it, and you look the way that Trump is running his campaign and the things that said, that it's really, Trump has figured out how to hack the news. Oh, I really think you're absolutely right. But why don't you explain what that means to the audience? Because I, I, I understand what you mean. But what do you mean by hack the news? Well, it, for a long time, you know, uh, for a long time, the news uh, operated as a public service. And there was a requirement that if you had a broadcast license from the FCC, you needed to, you needed to spend a certain amount of your, of your time, whether you were a, a TV station or a radio station, broadcasting things that were dem demonstrably in the public so interest. The, right, for the public good, that's right. Um, when did that go away? Well, that went away with, uh, with Ronald Reagan's administration in the 1980s. Um, and I think it really started when they gutted the, uh, the Fairness Act of the FCC. You know, they used to have the, well, not the Fairness Act, the Fairness Doctrine. You know, there used to be something called the Fairness Doctrine, which was when you aired a political viewpoint, you had to give equal time to an opposing viewpoint. And you don't have to do that anymore. Well, you can pretty clearly see that on things like Fox News, right? There, there's no opposing viewpoint on that. Right, right, right. And, and when you say Donald Trump has hacked the news, do you mean turned it against itself? I mean, gotten in, virally involved in sort of, I mean, what do you mean by hack the news? Well, Donald Trump has figured out in a way in uh, Donald Trump has figured out some things about uh, the news that the other candidates maybe uh, maybe they figured it out and maybe they haven't. Are just figuring it out, maybe. But uh, if they figured it out at all, um, but part of it is, uh, but part of it is that Donald Trump has some other strengths that allow him to do this. But he's figured out that uh, you can say something that's newsworthy and crazy and there won't be enough time to follow up on it. But even more so, if you say something else that's newsworthy and, and off the wall the next day, that will be the thing that gets coverage. And the things you said the day before that's, that's, that was wacky, like, forget that, that won't be covered because now the media is covering this new thing that you well, said. Well, you know, that's interesting you should say that because um, I thought um, that um, the um, scandal involving Trump University and, and the students feeling like they got ripped off when they attended, uh, you know, and, and Trump's subsequent, uh, you know, calling the Ohio-born uh, uh, judge of the, of the trial a Mexican or foreigner, I thought, surely this will demolish his career, but it, but it didn't. And obviously so other things came up. But it didn't because, you know, like th almost as soon as that happened, there was some other crazy thing about Trump that, that was on the news and was right. dominating all the right. coverage. And it's been like that all the time. I mean, there hasn't been, have there been maybe as many as three consecutive days that have gone by when there hasn't been some crazy thing no. about Trump? And he's on the news all the time. And the latest is that um, he um, funded a Florida Attorney General's campaign out of private, out of um, nonprofit uh, uh, funds um, in hopes of having her drop the case against Trump University. How long do you think that story will last? I think that's a fascinating story. I mean, it's a fascinating it's story. Bribery, <laughs> for one thing. It is. It seems like, like, right up to the line of, of bribery right. and maybe like tossing some stacks of cash over that line right. into the other side. But Trump has said that he, that he in the past, you know, was happy to pay for, um, uh, what, when you pay to be on the inside, what, you know, 
pay for play or or uh, pay for influence. He's he's he said it. He said in in castigating other candidates, he said, "Oh, I understand this whole play for pay." Um, nice use of castigating. By oh, the way. thank you. <laughs> uh, um, he, you know, I understand this whole play for play uh, thing. It's crooked. It's inside. And so, I mean, here's an example of him having done it. And I wonder if it'll stick now. I mean, nothing seems to sort of stick. But right? how's it going to stick when everybody else does it too, right? Like, when, uh, how can Hillary Clinton bring that up when, when uh, you know, there are, there are some issues involving, involving her with the Clinton Foundation? I'm sure they don't. And right. I'm sure they're, they're, they don't rise to the Absolutely. same level, right? But no, they don't no, have to well, rise to the same level. Or, or even be, or even be actually illegal in the way that probably Trump's things are. Overtly. But just the fact that you can bring them, the, that right. you can bring them up and talk about them and kind of raise questions right. without really coming out and making an accusation, you know, shows that there is a pay-for-play operation going on, and people have been doing it for a really long time and are reluctant to give it up. You know. Well, it, it cuts Hillary Clinton off at the knees as far as being able to bring that up, and and you know, and the thing of it is when Trump says that stuff. He's right. I mean, all the candidates do. There, there's such a strong link between money and getting elected. So let me ask you a question: Is your is your app gonna? Uh, can your app fix that or address it or? Oh, or good God, no! Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not going to give should? everyone. It's not going to give think, everyone a pony. Either. But don't you think? But I mean, don't you think sunlight is the best disinfectant? I mean, if we see, understand where money is coming from and uh, you know how it's coming and where it's coming, it'll it'll people's eyes will be opened a little bit. You know, sunlight is the best disinfectant, and if we could get more detail in into the uh, campaign finances than the government requires, then yeah, I think that would be really eye-opening. But uh, you know, one of the things that's happened is that campaign finance reform has has really been stymied every single time it tries to it, it's uh, it's attempted. Well, what if, what about Citizens United? Do you think Citizens United will stand? I would I would hope it wouldn't. It's so it's so. Obviously, I undemocratic. guess we should we should explain Citizens United, which is a Supreme Court case that enabled PACs to, or corporations to give unlimited amounts of money to uh, candidates. Would you say that's that's a correct assessment in a nutshell of yes. what Citizens United is? And um, obviously, you know, it skews all all uh, all kinds of. Uh, candidates' positions if, you know, large corporations can make large uh, contributions to their campaigns. I wanted to t say something before, though, when we were talking about, um, you know, uh, even Hillary Clinton. Uh, I read that um, Goldman Sachs is, to prevent conflict of interest, Goldman Sachs is telling their employees that they ought not give to Trump. That they or should they ought to support Hillary Clinton. <laughs> so so Hillary Clinton's in, you know plugged into the into the whole uh, play for play pay for play in a big way too, as you were saying. I mean, maybe not maybe not so blatantly as Donald Trump, but you know. I mean, I think almost every politician is is plugged into that. Uh, you know, any politician of any prominence, not necessarily in a corrupt way, but the fact is that in order to get elected, you typically need uh, like a really large uh, campaign chest. Right. You know. And they get that and by you know, hitting up corporate but, donors. But you know what? Trump doesn't seem to be suffering from lack of mobility on the ground and a lack of a big war chest. I mean, see, that's how he's hacked the media. He's hacked the media because he's he's found a way to get the coverage that he needs without paying for the c c coverage that he needs, without paying for commercials and so forth. Well, exactly. Like the largest expense of any campaign is, um, you know, is the the campaign itself. Is like the the media right. and getting that kind of exposure. And I've seen estimates that, that say Trump has received over a billion dollars worth of free media exposure just by being outrageous oh God, and by being so Donald incredible. Trump. So I, I want to change course just a little bit because we have only a few minutes left, and I have, I'm kind of interested. Um, you're from Kailua. I am from Kailua. And you were away from Hawaii for 20 some odd years. Yeah, almost 25. And so, what? Ha, tell me your thoughts on returning. Okay, the, the first thing that I really want to know is where did all the chickens come from? <laughs> I, yeah, there I are go a lot in, of chickens I go in here. downtown Kailua now or to the beach, you know, there were not chickens there when I was growing up. Now, you're a newcomer here, they so you're not so used to a chicken free. You're not used to a chicken Of course, there Kailua, are chickens there in but, Whole Foods. Um, <laughs> I went to the court. I went to the court in Kauai. There were, there were chickens all, fr all in front of the courthouse. I, 
I will have to get to the bottom of why there are now chickens yeah, well, and why you know, they were They're in probably their... involved in some kind of chicken-related lawsuit, and are there as witnesses, I'd have to guess. Why some wild chickens get loose and just start populating the islands? I mean, what... You know, so, I, I don't know what happened. So there. that's the biggest thing that struck you, that there's now a lot of chickens? Well, that's one of the, that's one of the big things. The, the other thing is that the demographics of Kailua have really changed, you know. It's really surprising to see... It's really surprising to see how... Um, you know, it, it's like there are not a lot of Kamainas there anymore. You know, it's like they're being priced out of Kailua. Um, the, and the entire character of downtown Kailua has changed so drastically. It used to be almost nothing but mom and pop stores, and there was the occasional big store there, like Liberty House. Liberty House, House right. Um, right, back when there was a, back when there was a Liberty House. I know. I'm just, yeah, so sad about that. Um, and before it was Long's, it was Crest, which was just great. I love Crest. And yeah. if that, you don't remember Crest, it was this five and dime store. Did it have a counter, your Crest? It did, it yeah, had it a has, counter. It has a food counter, and you could buy sewing notions, and it was just the greatest store. You could spend hours in it. And, and, and well, ours in New York City had, um, they also had pets. So they had pets. Ours had pets. Yeah. So you could, ha you could have a buy, you could visit the pets, you could buy a sewing pad. Right. You could, it was like a general store. They, they don't exist anymore. Everybody's, they don't. now we, it, everybody's like, a single purpose uh, uh, entity, right? You go to the hamburger place for hamburgers, you go to the hot dog place for hot dogs, you go to the fried chicken place for fried chicken. Well, except for some place like Target, which has, you know, everything, and you could probably fly a smaller plane around inside pets. the store. It doesn't have pets, Target. Can you say that for sure? Have you checked I haven't the entire checked all, store? All there the might Target. be pets there somewhere. So are you are you happy that you finally came on? You were so you, you, you were so <laughs> reluctant to come on. See, it's, it's fun. The show isn't is it? life in the law. I, I'm not. You've had I don't life know in the law. I... What, what's the biggest thing you've taken away from uh, having had a life in the law? Your father being a lawyer. Can you tell me? <laughs> you already know what this is. You're asking I do. What they Maybe call the audience a leading doesn't. question. The biggest thing I took away from growing up in a, a household with a, an attorney and later a judge for a father is that. I never wanted to be an attorney. The amount of money you could pay me to be an attorney <laughs> does not exist. So I think that's a good note to end life in the lawn because um, here's somebody with a p particular insight into um, a, a lawyer's day and a lawyer what what we what what kinds of obstacles we face, challenges we face, and uh, so now so the law has begotten an IT professional and the, and uh, frankly the IT and the law are really interconnected these days we could have talked a little little bit about that but we don't have we the could. time that's a whole other show whole but we could totally show. do a show it's, on it but it's fascinating law. it is changing and shaping the law it's changing and shaping the way the law is practiced well the law and is it's actually changing. so far behind i know it is. is but since since we're out of time now i'm going to just say thank you and i'll say i'll see you at home later cook me dinner <laughs> <laughs> and I want to thank everybody for tuning into Life in the Law. I'm Marianne Sasaki. We're on Wednesdays between 1 and 1.30, and I hope you join us. We talk like this all the time. This, uh, this uh, is totally how we talk, right?